Mm. And the next speaker is um, Dr. Franca. Um, the title is Limitations of Noisy Quantum Manilas. Please start. Uh, so let me start by thanking the organizers for this uh, invitation. It's, a, it's been a really nice workshop. So I'm going to talk about, uh, well, as the title says, limitations on noisy quantum annealers, uh, and it's going to be mostly based on results uh, I have with uh, Raul Garcia Patron at the University of um, Edinburgh. So, one second. Watch here. Oh, now it worked. Okay, sorry. So, as uh, in essentially all of the talks we had so far, um, I'm going to be interested in finding the ground state of some Hamiltonian that encodes the solution to a problem I care about. Uh, and um, in this talk, I will mostly focus on classical combinatorial optimization problems, uh, but the sort of techniques we develop can also be applied to more general uh, like ground state finding problems. And as in, I don't know, like the already 20 talks I've seen, we're gonna look at this uh, easing model uh, as our, our main example of, of what we care about. Um, and, okay, ah, no. Uh, and we're, our goal will be to try to find the ground state of such a model on a noisy quantum annealing machine and uh, try to rigorously understand how the noise affects the device's ability to find good solutions or, or the ground state. Now, um, in the first part of the talk, I'm going to consider a very, very simple noise model, the simplest imaginable. Namely, we're going to assume that every qubit on the device is uh, affected by the polarizing noise with some rate r. So, you know, like every qubit is affected by, by, by this um, quantum channel. And uh, for instance, this, this sort of noise can arise if you have control errors in your annealer. But later, I'm also going to talk about other uh, relevant noise models, for instance, amplitude damping or the phasing. But for now, let's just keep things as simple as possible, even though amplitude damping and the phasing are, of course, also a bit of a toy model, uh, just, just to illustrate what, what we can do. And um, for now, I'm also just going to look at the expectation value of the outputs of this noisy annealer. So we're not going to consider, like, what is the probability of finding the ground state or something like that. Just want to look at what is the expected energy of, of the output. But later, we're also going to look at uh, concentration inequalities that is uh, going to be able to say, oh, the probability of finding a state with this energy is this and this much. Uh, and these results are based on some other work I have with uh, Cambis Gouze, De Palma, and uh, Giacomo De Palma, and Milad Marvian. But for now, we're going to be in the simple setting, just to illustrate things. So in the ideal case, uh, we would like our annealer to implement this time-dependent Hamiltonian evolution. But we are going to assume, again, that we have some Limbladian term that is going to model the noise um, in our system. And we cannot really tune this, this Limbladian term. Maybe we can change the evolution time or the Hamiltonian, but this noise is there, unfortunately. And, um, and again, for now, you only consider this LT, this Limbladian term, to be this depolarizing noise on every qubit. So it's not global depolarizing noise. It's really like every qubit is affected by this depolarizing noise with the same rate, which I'm going to denote by R. And, OK, this is, I'm not sure why. OK. And as the time goes to infinity, of course, so if uh, this, this system will converge to a trivial state, it will just go to the maximally mixed state. So we know, we expect that uh, under noise, there, there should be a, a limitation as to how long we can do the annealing before our system just goes to this trivial state and then things become more or less useless. 
but our talk here will be, uh, our goal here will be to quantify uh, as, as best as possible when this will happen. Um, and as before, I'll, I'll, I'll extend it later to, to more general models. And again, we, we want to compare uh, this quantum annealer under noise against efficient classical algorithms. This will be our first goal. So let's say we know that in general finding the ground states of, of these uh, models is NP-hard uh, or NP-complete, but we also have some pretty good approximation um, algorithms that probably run in efficient time, and we just want to compare the uh, performance of those with the output of the noisy annealer for some annealing time t and some given noise rate. Uh, so this will be one of our goals. But our second goal will also to be able to compare just the performance of the noisy annealer with some heuristic algorithm of your choice. So maybe you, you don't have a proof that this algorithm is very good, you just see in practice that it's running well, and you just want to be able to compare it to some given quantum annealing device with some, some noise parameter. And the important point here is that we don't want to actually have to simulate this noisy quantum evolution. So we all know that simulating noisy quantum systems is a very hard task, but it doesn't mean that just because you cannot simulate this device on your classical machine that it's going to output better solutions to the problem you care about. So we want to be able to, be able to uh, say whether you'll find an advantage or not without actually having to simulate this complicated quantum system. So we first uh, show that this, uh, as one would expect intuitively, under the simple depolarizing rate model, uh, if you go to annealing times, which are roughly one over the rate, then if you just compare the outputs of, of uh, this noisy quantum device to uh, efficient Gibbs sampling, so like high temperature Gibbs sampling, then the uh, quantum annealer will not give you any substantial advantage. So as expected, uh, if, you're, if your annealing time is large enough so that you can feel the noise, then simple classical algorithms will uh, outperform it. Um, but, and I apologize once again, I don't know what's going on with my computer, the transitions are a bit strange, but um, as I said, we also care about the heuristic algorithms, and what we are able to show is that no matter what annealing uh, schedule you're doing or what evolution you're implementing, uh, if you actually compare to good heuristic algorithms, you're going to lose advantage uh, at a time that is, again, proportional to the noise rate, but the, the constant in front uh, can be also very small, so like 0 0.1 or 0 0.05. So, you know, even if you have a small density of errors, then the advantage against good heuristic algorithms is already lost. Okay. Um, and again, the nice part is that we don't have to actually simulate big devices. We can even go beyond what, are, uh, what is currently available and, and still draw similar conclusions. Now, how do we actually show this? What is the intuition behind the, the, the technique? So we start um, by the following picture. So here, uh, this is, uh, imagine your state is initialized in the zero state, and annealing is usually plus, but let's, let's take zero here, it doesn't make a big difference. Uh, and ideally, we want to follow the, the orange path over here. So it's going to drive us from, from the zero state to this uh, sigma infinity point here, that is the ground state of the model we care about. However, as I mentioned before, under the polarizing noise, the, your system will be driven instead to the maximally mixed state as the evolution time uh, increases. So it won't be able to follow this orange path. It will follow this, this black path to the interior where you have sigma zero corresponding to the maximally mixed state. And what we'll need to do uh, to derive our results is to quantify how fast this happens in the relative entropy, so or the KL divergence maybe as some of you might be more familiar with that term. And uh, what we're then able to do is to just, uh, at each time, we will be able to assign an inverse temperature 
to, uh, to the state, such that the Gibbs state at that inverse temperature has a similar performance when compared to the output of this noisy quantum computation. So at each step, we know, oh, th there's this much noise in the system. Based on this fact, we can assign an inverse temperature to a Gibbs state that will have a, a similar performance. And after that, um, we know that for most of the models you care about, uh, for, for inverse temperatures that are small enough below some critical value, you can actually simulate the, the Gibbs state classically uh, on, on, on classical computers efficiently. So we know that at some point we'll actually enter the region of efficient classical simulation, which is denoted in red over here. So all we need to do is, is to estimate whenever this will happen. Um, and just putting things together, we, as I mentioned before, if we have the noise rate to be this R over here, then the inverse temperature you have to assign to your Gibbs state to, to have a similar performance as whatever is going on the, on the noisy quantum device will uh, decrease exponentially uh, in time. And you have the promise that the output of the annealer will satisfy an equation like the one uh, down here. So below we see the expectation value of the energy on the output of the annealer. And we want to find the ground state, so we, wanna, we want this to be as small as possible. So what this is saying is that the Gibbs state with this uh, temperature I, I put uh, over here with this, this exponential decay in time will have an energy that is kind of similar to the one of, of the output of the annealer. So again, as we want to find the, the minimizer, if the energy of the Gibbs state is lower, it's better for, for the Gibbs state. So that's the sort of, of uh, result we can show. And because of that, um, as I said before, usually for, for most models, there is some critical temperature beta C, such that if this beta is below that, then we are in the regime where you can observe similar energies uh, just by, by doing it classically. And we see here that this will happen in, in, in a time that, is, that just depends on one over R, roughly. So doesn't, no dependency on, on system size. Although most of the previous results had some sort of dependency on system size, here we see that uh, actually at constant time, just depending on the noise rate, um, classical algorithms will, will have a similar performance. And I should also stress that this is independent of whatever, what, what evolution you're, you're actually implementing. This is just a feature of, of the noise. Now, just a quick discussion of the technical tools we use. Uh, we use the fact that uh, the relative entropy um, contracts uniformly under this sort of noise. So it doesn't matter what input state you have, what, what sort of annealing path you have, as long as you have this noise model, the relative entropy will, will contract uh, exponentially in time. And uh, from that, you can just uh, use the, uh, um, a variation of the maximum entropy principle to assign this inverse temperature to this, this annealing model you have. And then to, to get this, this critical temperature, you just have to get your a favorite result from the literature that tells you that there is such a critical temperature and apply it to, to the model you care about and for the estimates you care about. But as we all know, uh, actually, if you want to solve a practical problem, you're not going to do it uh, through high temperature Gibbs sampling. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to try to compare when uh, annealing will lose advantage against high temperature sampling, Gibbs sampling, because nobody is going to do that. So we want to uh, be able to compare it to your favorite efficient classical algorithm, or sorry, heuristic algorithm. And uh, what, are, what can our technique do? So let's say you run your favorite algorithm for your favorite problem, and you obtain some energy EC. After that, uh, you want then to know if, uh, let's say, if you had access to a large quantum annealer with a given noise rate, would you 
actually expect a significantly smaller energy for the output um, if you were annealing for, for a given time. And, you know, maybe we're even talking about devices that are not available, so this problem instance is larger than what, what can be solved in current devices, and we are in the regime where you cannot simulate such a machine classically, so even then you want to be able to have some estimate as to whether you should expect to uh, obtain any advantage through quantum methods. And the way we do this uh, is uh, very similar to what I discussed before, but uh, so we again are in this picture where we are collapsing to the, to the maximally mixed state that is so, sort of trivial. But uh, we can then just, uh, if we can quantify how fast this happens in relative entropy, then it's easy to, to obtain lower bounds on the energy of, of the output. So, and in particular, if this lower bound tells you that you have a separation between the output you observe from the classical algorithm, then you know that you cannot really expect the quantum annealer to give you any sort of advantage. So, um, and in this way, without having to actually simulate the quantum device, you're able to say like, oh, actually, I, I don't expect it to be better than my favorite heuristic algorithm. And uh, to, to get this, we use the variational characterization of the relative entropy, which looks like this. It says that the energy of the output of the annealer is lower bounded. And again, we want to find minima, so it's better we, we only care about lower bounds. Um, by the log of the partition function uh, minus this, this relative entropy term, okay? And uh, if, you, if you let beta go very close to zero, then uh, this first term, like minus log partition function plus n times beta to the minus one, will converge to zero, which is just the energy of the maximally mixed state. But if you let beta go very small to zero, uh, sorry, if you let beta very small, the second term will explode, right? Uh, so you have to somehow uh, see what, how, the, how these two things um, interplay. Um, and the important point is that this formula can be evaluated efficiently for a, a small range of beta. Because we also know that for beta, in, in some uh, temperature range, you can actually approximately evaluate the log partition function. So you can actually evaluate this function, uh, sorry, this bound for, for a range of beta and, and, and get the lower bounds, as long as you can also control this term over here. And as I said before, using these relative entropy convergence techniques, you can, you can bound this, this, this second term. So by evaluating it uh, by plugging in an estimate on, on this last term and evaluating the log partition function for some range of beta, you can then go, get your lower bound on the energy of the output. So uh, here is an example of how this performs in, in practice. So I should say, of course, that all of the techniques we developed also work for the, for the circuit model, not only annealing. And uh, here I'm actually comparing it to the results of uh, QAOA on the Sycamore device. Um, and uh, because these instances are, are very small, I evaluated the, the variational formula I had before for, for a large range of beta, even outside this, this critical temperature range. Uh, and I just, uh, as a noise model, I took the polarizing noise with the average gate fidelity stated in the paper. So let me explain you the plot. So unfortunately, I don't think you can see my mouse. As I mentioned, I'm having a bit of, I'm having some technical trouble, but let me uh, try to explain it anyways. So the yell, so this, these are the results for the SK model on uh, like QAOA for the SK model. Uh, I'm plotting the, the ratio between the ground state energy and the energy found, okay? So the orange line, one would be like the, the ground state, right? Um, the, the gray line is what you expect to find with, say, uh, an STP relaxation, and uh, the, the, the green line is what they expected to see if there was no noise in their system. And the yellow dots are the energies they actually observed. So, you know, we see the disparity between the green line and the yellow dots, which shows the effect of the noise. 
And the black dots are actually what our bound uh, predicts that, uh, or gives us an, uh, a bound on the energy they could observe given these noise levels and circuit depths and so on. And we see that as the number of qubits increases and uh, the noise starts to dominate, uh, we are not too off. So at least in, in this uh, small example, we, we actually obtain uh, reasonable results from, from our bounds. And yeah, so just uh, I, I showed you these two different ways of, of just bounding how well the, the noisy annealer can perform. The first one was by comparing it to some, some Gibbs state, and the second one was by evaluating this, this variational formula. Um, and what is the difference between them? The first one is nice because it lets you do uh, some an, um, analytical um, analysis of, of um, what, what you expect. You can, you can rigorously show that the, the amount of noise you can tolerate is independent of system size and things like that. But it comes at the expense of slightly weaker bounds. And the second one, it has the advantage of, of being tight. Actually, if you let beta go to infinity there, you, uh, what you get is just the ground state energy. So uh, this will always be a tight bound if you're allowed to, to evaluate it for all betas you want. But um, you, you need to numerically evaluate it in practice to, to get something. Um, so it's less useful to, to do analytical calculations. However, um, it's nice that you can compare it just to any algorithm you like. You can evaluate this formula, compare it to whatever you get from your classical algorithm, and then draw conclusions. Okay, so now, I, as I said, I only talked about very simple noise models, the simplest you can imagine, one side, uh, the, the polarizing noise, uh, and we want to go a bit beyond that. So what we'll always need is that this noise is driving you to some unique fixed point. So uh, that there is this full rank state here such that you have this, this exponential decay of the relative entropy. And inequalities like that have been shown for a variety of, of noise models, but I, I won't get into that. Um, and the, in particular, there is one very popular noise model for which this is not true, namely the phasing because period of phasing doesn't have uh, a unique fixed point, right? Any diagonal state or classical state will be left invariant by the phasing. So uh, that's something we are, we are working on. And uh, we, again, will just try to quantify how fast this noisy annealing calculation will go to this, this fixed point or somewhere that it's close to that fixed point. But this is a bit more tricky in relative entropy because it does not satisfy say the triangle inequality and other nice, uh, um, doesn't have other simple nice properties of, of distance measures. However, we're still able to, to show the, the following uh, inequality. So if you take uh, on the left-hand side below, we have the relative entropy between the output of this noisy quantum manealer and uh, this, this fixed point of the noise. And we see two terms. The first one is what we had before, just this exponential decay to the, to the fixed point. And uh, the second one is something that depends on the commutator between the, the Hamiltonian evolution and, and this fixed point. But notice that there is a e to the minus alpha t term there, and t is the like, largest time you go to. So whatever happens at, uh, uh, sorry, t minus tau. So whatever happens at the beginning of the computation doesn't matter too much. Uh, the only thing you need for the second term to, sort of, to, to uh, decay to zero is that at late times of the computation, the fixed point of the noise and the Hamiltonian actually commute. And then this, this term over there will, will go to zero. So let me give you an example where uh, this actually holds. So let's just assume for simplicity that our fixed point is just, uh, let's say, something like what I have over there, like e to the minus beta zi for some uh, value of beta. And uh, we, we actually want to, to optimize classical problems, right? Then at the end of the annealing, the Hamiltonian will be close to diagonal because we are, we are optimizing 
a classical problem, so it will commute with this fixed point. So for classical optimization problems, we are indeed in this regime where this second term over here will, will converge to zero. But there are some caveats, okay? So um, for instance, although we can show that this will also still go to zero for, the, for more generalized noise models, uh, we cannot work very, this technique doesn't work very well when the fixed point is very pure. So for instance, if you have pure dephasing, these things will also blow up. And uh, so to make things a bit more concrete, let's assume that we again have just one qubit noise and we have a combination of three sorts of noise sources. The first is amplitude damping, which will drive you to, to zero. The phasing, which will just kill off diagonal entries, right? And these sort of control errors, which lead to the polarized looking noise. Um, so this is still a, a toy model, but at least one step closer to something realistic. And you can show that if you have these uh, combinations of, of noise models, you'll have a, a, a fixed point, which is again of this simple product form with the inverse temperature depending on the ratio between the amplitude damping and the control. The larger the amplitude damping, the purer it will be, and, and so on. And uh, so putting all these assumptions together and assuming a linear annealing path, what we then get from our result is that this relative entropy between the output of the annealer and just this, this trivial fixed point will be given by this formula down there. So let's just go a bit deeper into what this is telling us. Um, first, we have this, this term that is just an exponential decay. It's essentially the same as we had before in the, in the toy model of the depolarizing noise, but we have this rest term over here that has a different uh, behavior. So uh, first of all, again, everything explodes if you let uh, gamma go to, to infinity, so you have very pure fixed points. Um, and we have now a polynomial decay with, with time and uh, with a prefactor that is R squared. And so the, the, this relative entropy will, dec will decrease a bit slower than in the case where we just had uh, the system being driven to the maximally mixed state. Now, uh, a very natural question to ask is, is this just a consequence of uh, my stupidity or, or lack of better tools or whatever? Or is there actually a, a fundamental difference between uh, different noise models? So is it actually easier to deal with uh, noise models that for, like amplitude damping than depolarizing noise? And there are some results in the literature that indicate that this might actually be the case. So for instance, there's this quantum refrigerator construction by uh, Gottesmann uh, from 2015, where they show that, okay, it's in the circuit model, but they show that if you have the polarizing noise, then, and you don't have access to fresh qubits, then there is no like threshold theorem. But if you have amplitude damping noise, then even without access to fresh qubits, you can uh, perform arbitrarily long quantum computations. So I think that's, that's an interesting question as to whether this, this is fundamental or just uh, lack of, of creativity or better tools. Um, and then we can easily generalize the bounds I discussed before, but to these uh, other fixed points, this uh, variational characterization still holds, but now with a slightly modified uh, partition function, so you have to account for the fact that uh, your, your noise is gonna bias you. So the thing is that now we, we add this, this additional term to the partition function that will make sure that uh, the, the lower bound also is biased towards m more of the outputs being zero than when we just had the uniform noise. And uh, yeah, just, just to show you the effect that different noise models have on the bound. Here we have these three curves. So R3 is again the, the control errors. So like these, at least for R bounds, are the, the very bad ones. And we see that if uh, R1, which is the, the um, amplitude damping rate, is, as, is non-negligible, then this decay will be very slow. Whereas if 
if it's uh, negligible compared to the control error rates, then this will be ver a very fast decay. Okay, so it is possible to extend what, what we did before. Um, sorry, was there a question? Or I guess just that. Uh, we can extend what we did before to these other general, uh, other noise, noise models, but at the expense of, of poorer bounds. Uh, and uh, right now we are also generalizing it to the phasing. Again, the problem being that it doesn't contract uniformly, uh, but we, we are now working on also getting similar results for pure the phasing noise. And uh, in the last few minutes I have available, I would just like to talk a bit about concentration bounds. So uh, as I said before, so far we only talked about the expectation value, but let's say we had, we could be in the very extreme case where with, with probability, with a very, let's say 99% probability we output complete garbage and 1% probability we output the right solution, expectation value would be very bad, but actually this would be an amazing solver, right? Uh, so we want to analyze actually the, the probability of observing good outcomes. Um, and we de derived similar bounds as to what I was showing to you before for the expectation value, but now uh, in concentration, not in, in probability, not in, in expectation. So um, I don't want to get, um, uh, I, I won't get into the details of how we prove it, I'll just give you a, a quick overview, but the, the message is the same, that like uh, as long as the annealing time is large enough so that you can uh, feel the noise, uh, the probability of, of observing good solutions or non-trivial solutions is, is exponentially small in system size. So um, I will go back to the baby model of, of the polarizing noise, um, but uh, the main technical difference is that if before I was quantifying convergence in relative entropy, now you'll have to look at the so-called uh, sandwich rene divergences to, to, to look at uh, concentration and quantify convergence there. Uh, but similar techniques uh, exist to, to control this sort of entropy, uh, uh, relative entropy decay under noise. Uh, and I just want to give you an example of the sort of concentration inequality we get. So let's say we have one qubit the polarizing noise with rate r, and hi is just, uh, let's say, an easy model on a graph with maximum degree delta then we can show that the, uh, by in this, that the probability that the outcome of the device will have uh, an energy that deviates significantly from just, let's say, pick epsilon to be a small constant and something that decays exponentially in the time is exponentially small in system size. So this means that as long as the time uh, large, big T is big enough for, for this e to the minus two rt term to see some, some sort of contraction, you already be exponentially concentrated uh, around, let's say, not so interesting output strings. And uh, so in particular, oh. um, In particular, if, if the time is of order r to the minus one, you'll essentially never see the ground state. So uh, we have some other results in this paper I don't have time to, to talk about, but they essentially show that uh, the popular error mitigation techniques we have right now do not really change the, the big picture. Um, and if, if you have, expo um, you also show that then there's no exponential advantage under noise uh, if, uh, if the noise rate does not scale with, with system size because of the concentration inequality I showed you before. You would have to sample an exponential number of times to see non-trivial strings at, at those annealing times. And um, I hopefully also convince you that these relative entropy convergence methods give you a nice way to rigorously analyze the performance under noise. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, we see that if you have a small error density, then it's very unlikely that you're going to outperform quant uh, like heuristic classical algorithms. But um, 
there are still some, some important problems. Uh, as I mentioned before, we, it would be nice to extend it to more noise models, see if there is actually also a difference whether you have amplitude damping or, or control or whatever, or it's just uh, an artifact of, of poor bounds. And um, in all of the results I showed you, I assumed that this contraction uh, of this relative entropy is independent of the state. In practice, if you're looking at interesting, let's say highly entangled states, this, this contraction can, can be much worse. So this, this would con make you converge to trivial states even faster than predicted here. So that's also something we're currently investigating. Um, and it would, of course, be nice to, to see what is the effect of some primitive error correction methods um, to see what sort of uh, effect do they have, how much is needed to do these sorts of analysis, because this would be kind of easy to incorporate into our, our, our framework uh, and can, can be maybe uh, instructive. And um, I only showed you this benchmark on the, the Google device. Of course, it would also be very nice to run it on, on other devices available and see if we see an agreement or if whatever my technique is doing is completely off or, yeah, just, just to see the, to, to what extent it can be applied to, to other devices. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks, that was, that was really interesting. Um, so I have a few comments. Uh, the first one is that um, I'm glad that you did the uh, beyond depolarizing. Mm -hmm. um, because depolarizing noise is, is not particularly relevant for quantum annealing, mm -hmm. but uh, certainly amplitude damping is. Um, the more significant comment is that the, the model where the Lombardian is time independent ah, yeah, yeah. is not a good model. Yes, I know you have a paper on this, right? Like, well, uh, I mean, yeah, many yeah, people yeah. have papers on this. Yeah, 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 yeah but, uh, <laughs> but the Lombardian is, is definitely time dependent. Yes. In a, uh, in a way that I think matters uh, for your bounds. So it would be very interesting to see what happens if you um, take that into account. And thirdly, the uh, error correction, uh, so there, there is a body of work on error correction for quantum annealing, mm -hmm. uh, in particular for these Markovian models. Mm -hmm. And we know that there are, there are methods um, in introducing, for example, stabilizer code, subsystem, or, or subspace codes which grow the gap. The gap somehow didn't appear at all in your, in your discussion. Uh, mm -hmm. So it would be interesting to see um, if these are mitigation. Well, it's not error mitigation in the sense that you talked about, but error suppression methods, mm -hmm. uh, whether they change the results. Yes, yes, so uh, thanks for, for the comments. Indeed, I forgot to mention this. Uh, I think it would be highly relevant to uh, also adapt the results to time dependent. Uh, Limbladians, I think this shouldn't be too much work. Uh, and uh, yeah, maybe, maybe you can address this shortly in the future. And uh, just on the error correction front, um, indeed, like what uh, I guess you, you would just have to see how much entropy these methods allow you to save and things like that. And as you said, if you have some explicit control over the gap, that, that could probably also be taken into account. Uh, that's also something we want to investigate in the near future. Thanks. Uh, I have a question about your concentration bound. Yes. Would you say a few words about the technique that you have used in order to get it? Because uh, usually people, uh, I'm, at least I'm familiar with the uh, Levy concentration lemma, but that would give you some different dependence on epsilon. Mm -hmm. You have an epsilon as opposed to an epsilon square, so it's a much better result, so I'd like to hear about that. Oh, um, maybe maybe there was a typo. Let me check. So let me just go back. So did I get an error here? So let me just check. So the probability should be of constant order if I let uh, square root of n. So if I choose epsilon. Indeed, sorry, that's a typo, epsilon, epsilon squared. Sorry about that. Huh? No, 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 but, uh, but the, the technique is, is as follows. You, um, you show exponential, you show this sort of concentration for the, 
for the fixed point of the noise, and then you show if you if you combine the concentration for the fixed point with um, a relative entropy bound, you are the, you are then able to transfer uh, the concentration bound from the fixed point to states that are close in in relative entropy. So that's that's more or less how it works. So really interesting talk. Um, so here, and actually conveniently, the right slide is up. Um, when you um, talk about finding the ground state being exponentially unlikely, and this is basically treated as a no-go, is that actually appropriate for optimization? Because you kind of know you're going to have to run exponentially long unless something very surprising happens with complexity theory. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So is it justified to immediately rule out these cases where it's exponentially unlikely as having any advantage? Or could you say, well, maybe there's still something there. You just do it many times. Sure. So um, notice that there is this dependency on, on T here. So uh, the, the longer the annealing time, the more you'll, you'll be uh, concentrated around more and more trivial states. And then at some point, you'll be in the zone where uh, the classical algorithms are provably better than what, whatever you're doing. So uh, in order to, let's say, not compare to the ground state, but say states you can reach uh, with efficient classical methods, you would just have to go to higher t's, and then, and then you would be concentrated exponentially in the zone uh, outside of those strings. Does that make sense? Yeah, the moderate values of t, you still might be in this regime, but it could still sort of be OK. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. OK, cool. Um, actually, I'm a little bit uh, uh, confused about uh, the idea that uh, with uh, longer annual time, you uh, uh, always at some point will lose the advantage. Um, because uh, so, uh, 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 because um, uh, if you have a long uh, annual time with the annealer, which has some finite temperature, then the interaction uh, with the bath, uh, uh, at least uh, at the later stages of the anneal, uh, it appears, would uh, move the state towards the Gibbs state corresponding to the temperature of the bath. And if the temperature of the bath is uh, sufficiently low that uh, uh, sampling the Gibbs state at that temperature is itself non-trivial and useful task, then uh, uh, it looks like uh, even very long annual times at a finite interaction with the bath are useful. It's, can you yes, comment I, on that? I can comment on that. So uh, I think this is best illustrated, let me go back here, uh, in this formula. So let's say that this, the, the sigma, I mean this uh, parameter gamma here is corresponding to the um, temperature of, of, the, of, of the fixed point, right? So if you, like you, are assuming that the, the, the fixed point or the, the thermal state you're going to is a very low temperature state, then this will blow up, right? So like this, these prefactors like this cosine hyperbolicus of gamma or, and more importantly, the sinus hyperbolicus, they will blow up. So uh, this bound will be sort of trivial unless you go to very large times. And then, uh, so this, this convergence will be sort of low if, you're, if your fixed point itself is, is very pure. Um, so, but you know, like if, but what you're saying then is, OK, I'll, it will take me a long time, and I will converge to this state, which might be actually difficult to sample from. But um, you know, the energy will just be always be comparable to sampling from, from that. So it's, I'm not sure if that's useful to actually solve an optimization problem, right? So that's, does that answer your question? Well. Uh... So if the final Hamiltonian is the classical Hamiltonian in the annealing uh, process, and the gap between the uh, ground state and the first excited state is lar significantly larger than the temperature, then we actually converge to a state. 
like in the limit when uh, the annealing time goes to infinity, we converge to the state with very high probability of the ground state. No, right? because of the noise, right? The noise will drive you to to the to the fixed point of of the of the noise, not of not to the solution, right? I mean, this is what this equation is telling us. That, that's actually confusing, right? Because. Um, uh, the uh, quantum annealer implements uh, some Hamiltonian, right? Yes. The uh, Hamiltonian uh, uh, has the ground state, which is the uh, state you're interested in. So um, if uh, the reason interaction with the bath, it's reasonable that uh, uh, if the temperature of the bath is small, then the state converges to the Gibbs state of that Hamiltonian. No? Oh, not, not I mean, okay, so, so maybe uh, the, the confusion is coming from the fact that uh, the, the sort of noise model I'm considering does not model the situation you're considering well. But if you, if you, if you agree with my noise model, then this is not what happens. Then you're just going to converge to some sort of trivial state. That... Yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, I think uh, I think that my confusion is that it seems that this noise model uh, is not accurate in uh, at least. But some... I mean, I, I should say, for instance, control errors, right? They are there, and control errors they will just kick in entropy, right? So, for instance, this, this will by itself already, they will always be there, right? Okay, so let's, oh, okay, the last question. Hi, thanks for the very interesting talk. So, uh, I actually don't know if I misread it somewhere, but I'm a bit confused. So, in the final Outlook slide, you had this looking into uh, error correction and how this affects all the analysis that you do. But before that, uh, you had, so, uh, no, 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 it was uh, actually earlier. You said earlier. that error mitigation does not change the general picture of your results. Ah, yeah, so I think it was over here. I mean, yeah, it just said, like, error mitigation does not change the, the picture, but I can just go to the slide anyways, although it's not very informative. Yeah, um, yeah, sure. What about you considering here for error mitigation? How did you, I mean, how did you draw the distinction and how did you make this analysis? Yes, so, um, exactly. So what we show in our, in our paper is uh, the, following, the following way of quantifying that error mitigation is not very useful. Uh, the idea, I mean, first of all, we, we distinguish between two forms uh, of, of error mitigation and you know, there's a wild zoo of error mitigation techniques out there and it's very difficult to even properly define what it is and what is like error correction or like it's, so may, maybe what you have in mind is not what I have in mind, but we distinguish between two sorts of error mitigation protocols. The first ones are those that allow you to extract expectation values of noiseless, uh, of, of a noiseless computation from noisy ones. And what we show is that somehow the, the overhead and the number of samples that you would need to get a decent um, estimate is, is exponential. And another one, uh, another protocol we analyzed are these, uh, how are they called, uh, uh, something cooling. Uh, yeah, essentially the idea is you, you take many copies of your quantum state and you do some sort of generalized swap test to, to, to prepare the state like rho to some power. Um, and we show that the uh, probability of such a procedure working is exponentially small. So these are some of the things we, we considered. But again, as there's this wide zoo of, of protocols, there might be still some something we didn't consider there. Okay, thanks. There are comments in chat. Oh, should I open them? Uh, sorry, my computer is, oh. is terrible. I, I cannot... Uh, uh, oh, I see. Okay, thanks. So yeah, uh, I should actually say that uh, you should actually look at the published version. The archive version is 
outdated and we, because of the embargo, we cannot update it. So I recommend looking at the published version, not the, the archive version. Maybe the comments in chat um, not answered. Oh, it's answered. So let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>